We're live, Modasa. We're live? All right. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you once again for joining us uh, for uh, a U Unicorn seminar. Um, so before I introduce our uh, August uh, speakers for today, um, just a, a highlight in point is that this will be the last uh, Unicorn seminar for at least the foreseeable future, probably till September, October time. So we're going for a long break because of lots of physical conferences coming up as well. Um, and so before I uh, introduce our guests, I just want to thank the Unicorn Committee and all the speakers this year. Um, we've had a really wonderful time and uh, there's some amazing talks and you can always access those, if you already don't know this, uh, on YouTube. Um, and of course, um, there will be the summer school or oh, winter school that we'll do next year as well, hopefully. Um, as always, the rules. Uh, please switch off your cameras and your microphones when the talks are happening. Um, when the talks finish, we'll do a Q&A with the speaker. Um, and um, you can join us through uh, a Zoom chat or you can raise your hand to speak. Um, alternatively, if you're joining us on YouTube, please put your comments in the YouTube chat and that will be passed on to myself to ask speakers. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Um, uh, this will be Martin Frimmer. So Martin, I'm sure, is very familiar to many of you here. Um, he studied physics at TU Munich and obtained a PhD from the University of Amsterdam in 2012 uh, for his work on nanophotonic systems. Um, he then moved to ETA Zurich um, and has, uh, has a main focus on optical precision measurements and levitated optomechanical systems. Um, and he has this, uh, I came across this amazing paper he wrote um, <laughs> Uh, with Alexander, who's also our other speaker on parametric optomechanics. And that was actually my first introduction to the topic. Um, and so it's really fitting to invite Martin to give a talk on this, um, introduce the topic to the wider audience. So Martin, without further ado, uh, the floor is uh, yours and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mudasa. Uh, let me share my screen. Does this look all right to you guys? Yes, that's great. Okay. So um, I assume you're going to interrupt me if there is a question, this uh, should always be possible. Um, and uh, if there's something unclear, you, can, you uh, should feel free to interrupt. Um, I'm going to um, take a relatively slow and didactic approach, and it's probably the approach that um, an experimentalist likes, because I'm myself an experimentalist. So what I'm going to do in this talk is to introduce an optomechanical system, which is a levitated system. I'm not assuming that everybody is familiar with that, so I apologize to those who already are. And at hand of this um, example of a specific optomechanical system, I want to discuss a few uh, parametric effects. And um, this will, the first one is going to be maybe very, um, uh, very familiar to some of you, which is the parametric cooling of center of mass motion. And I hope that this is a gentle uh, introduction to this uh, topic of parametric effects. Um, the second example I've picked is the parametric coupling of different oscillation modes of such a levitated oscillator. And the third example is going to be um, how we can turn such an oscillator into a parametron and um, how we can flip its state or flip its phase um, in a very rapid fashion. Okay, so um, my optomechanical system is a uh, particle that's trapped in a tightly focused laser beam. So if you uh, look here, this bright green spot in the center, this is a small dielectric particle and it's held in place by a laser, which you don't see. It's propagating in this case from left to right. And it's focused by a lens, which is 
here behind this shiny green thing, which is just a metal holder. Okay, this is the particle I'm talking about. And what I'm interested in is the center of mass motion of this particle. And it has three degrees of freedom. So in the end, I will talk about three oscillators. Okay, so just to set the, the stage with uh, some basic physics, what you need to understand is that in this optical trap, the particle is held by the optical gradient force. A dielectric object is a high field seeker. So the system tries to minimize its energy by this particle moving to the region of largest field intensity. And this is how an optical tweezer works. So I can think about the intensity distribution of the light field as a potential where the field, the point of maximum intensity represents the potential minimum. Okay. And now you can think about this particle like a marble in a bowl. It's just rolling around within this three-dimensional potential. The particle is significantly smaller than the wavelength we use. So modeling it as a dipolar point scatter is a pretty good approximation in our case. Now the particle scatters the light. We have seen that in this photograph earlier on. And we can send the scattered light to a detector. I do not want to go into any details, but we can measure the position of this particle in 3D as a function of time. And this is what you see here on the right-hand side. I've plotted on the horizontal axis time and on the vertical axis, the particle's position. And we typically, and you all have an optomechanics background, we typically discuss the power spectral densities. So we look at the Fourier transform, or rather it's absolute value squared. We call this a power spectrum. Um, and for these three particle modes, or so the three degrees of freedom of this particle center of mass, we find three Lorentzians, which indicates that to first order, this trapping potential is harmonic. Um, and the particle is, is three harmonic oscillators, one for each degree of freedom. Um, what is interesting and will become important later on is that the X and Y mode, and X and Y in my, um, my standard is the motion in the focal plane and the oscillation frequency in the focal plane is these two frequencies, they are non-degenerate. And the reason is that the field is linearly polarized which in the strongly focused beam gives rise to a slight elongation of the optical potential. And it's a little bit softer along the polarization axis as compared to perpendicular to the polarization axis. Um, so I want to write down an equation of motion here for each degree of freedom of the center of mass of this particle. So the x i are x one, two, and three, or x, y, z, as you like to call them. And this is a Newtonian equation of motion with an inertial term, a damping term, and the restoring force. And the whole system is driven by uh, fluctuating forces that um, arise due to some thermal bath, whatever that may be. In the simplest case, it will be just the gas surrounding this particle being at a finite temperature. We can also tune the damping rate in the system, for example, by controlling the pressure in the vacuum chamber. Um, so by pumping down to vacuum, we can reach the high quality factors of this mechanical oscillator. We can also tune the stiffness of the optical trap. Um, it is actually the optical intensity that sets the stiffness of this harmonic oscillators spring, if you like. Um, so what we can do now is we can exploit this uh, control or the trap stiffness to parametrically act on the oscillator uh, because we can make our, our spring constant stiffer and softer. And if you do this in a clever way, you can actually pump energy into the oscillator or take it out of the oscillator. And what you have to do in order to, to do that is to um, modulate the stiffness of the optical trap at twice the natural frequency of the oscillator. Um, you can um, envision this um, very simply for the case of cooling, say, whenever the particle is rolling up the potential hill, you make the potential a bit stiffer 
to make the particle not get as high up. And whenever the particle is rolling back towards the trap center, you make the trap a little bit softer in order to make it uh, acquire less uh, momentum on the way down. Okay. And since the, the trap is symmetric, you see that you have to repeat the same process on the other side. And this is why very naturally you have to do your modulation at twice the oscillation frequency. Okay. So this is a parametrically driven oscillator. And you can pick the phase of your parametric modulation in two ways, or you can pick it as you like. Two scenarios stand out. One is where you draw energy out of the oscillator where you perform parametric cooling or the other one with opposite phase where you pump energy into the oscillator. This is what a child on a swing typically does. And with this uh, relatively simple scheme, you can then cool the oscillator and a measure for the energy in the oscillator is the area under the power spectral density. And the power spectral density of one of these center of mass modes is shown here. So what is, what is done in this experiment is you cool the center of mass motion of this, um, this levitated particle um, and you can express the, the center of mass energy in this mode in units of quanta, which is done here. Okay, and this is a called parametric feedback cooling. Um, you see that you can cooling increasingly more um, as you reduce the pressure in the vacuum chamber because this coupling to the bath um, continuously um, provides energy back to the oscillator. So the reheating is given by the damping rate gamma together with the temperature T of the bath. Okay. So I assume that this was something that uh, most of you were familiar with. And now we can move on and look at a uh, maybe a little bit more subtle application of parametric modulation here. And here I want to think about the coupling of um, two modes of oscillation of this particle. And what we're going to look at is the motion of the particle in the focal plane. And I want to call these two degrees of freedom X and Y, okay? Remember, the eigenfrequencies in this plane are non-degenerate. They are split due to the linear polarization of the laser beam. Okay, so we can clearly distinguish this oscillation mode along X and along Y. Now, what we are going to do is we're gonna think about what happens when we tilt the orientation of the potential. Okay, so when we slightly rotate the polarization direction, if you will, Okay, so as is shown here, we have the small angle phi here by which we tilt, rotate the potential. Now suddenly the X and the Y mode, they are not eigenmodes anymore. Okay, so we are now in a basis where we have a coupling between these two modes, X and Y. Okay, so if we think about this in frequency space, then we have here um, two distinct eigenfrequencies of this X and Y oscillator. In this case, they're at maybe 117 and 143 kilohertz. Okay, these are, and if we don't do anything, then these are just the two eigenmodes of these two harmonic oscillators. Now, if we start to wiggle our potential, so if we rotate our potential by this small angle back and forth, yeah, and we do this modulation of the potential at twice frequency difference between the oscillators, we can actually couple these two. So what we do by this potential rotation is we introduce a spring, if you like, that couples these two harmonic oscillators. And since this spring is modulated at a frequency which matches the frequency splitting between the original oscillators, we hit a resonance. And this is what you see here. So what is plotted on the bottom right uh, is on the horizontal axis, the drive frequency. That is the frequency at which I wiggle my potential back and forth. And on the vertical axis, I plot the eigenmode frequencies. And now each mode is dressed by the coupling to its neighbor. Okay, what bridges the frequency gap is the fact that the coupling is modulated at the frequency difference. 
And this is why you observe this characteristic anti-crossing here. So when the drive frequency hits here, what is this 27 kilohertz? You're resonant. And this is when you can bridge this frequency gap between 117 and 144 kilohertz. Okay, so this is a, a, a parametric coupling effect. Now, it, we just looked at this in, in the frequency domain. So there, this is where we see that these modes due to the dressing or the coupling, they split. We can also look at this in the time domain. So what is um, shown here is an experiment where we initialize the system with the Y oscillator relatively cold in other words, the oscillation along y was small, while the oscillation along x was large. And this is why I want to say that the x oscillator was hot. And then here at the time of, in this case, about five milliseconds, we turn on the coupling between these modes. So we start to wiggle our potential back and forth by this small angle, okay? And we wiggle at the frequency which matches the frequency splitting between the two modes. And then we see that these two oscillators, they start to exchange energy. So we see this beating in the population, if you like. So from the hot oscillator, energy is flowing into the cold one and vice versa, and they periodically exchange their energy. Now, if you want to describe this effect uh, theoretically, it's actually not difficult at all. We write down two equations of motion for two coupled oscillators. So I have two degrees of freedom, X and Y. This is the position of the particle in the focal plane. Okay, there is a, here, this, this everything that's here in this first uh, square bracket. This is um, the Newtonian part of the equation of motion. Um, I've taken out uh, what I want to call a carrier frequency omega zero. And the two oscillators are split in frequency by what is here called capital omega s because they are non-degenerate. Remember 117 and 144 kilohertz. Okay? And the two are coupled by the wiggling of our potential, by the rotation of our potential. And this is this coupling term here, which carries a time dependence at the modulation frequency, which is here called small omega. Okay? And now if you work out the mass of this system, um, we will find um, what, what we just saw, okay? So what we do is um, we define this carrier frequency, we um, define the splitting frequency and the coupling frequency. So everything is, is formulated in terms of rates here. We write the system in a slow flow approximation. So we um, assume that the motion of each, os each oscillator is given by a fast carrier which oscillates here at this frequency capital omega zero. And there is a slowly varying amplitude um, that multiplies this carrier wave. And these amplitudes are called A and B for X and the Y motion of the, the oscillator. And then in this uh, slowly varying um, envelope approximation where we assume that there's no fast time dependence of these envelopes, we find a first order in time differential equation for A and B. And if you stare at this, it looks pretty familiar. So there's an I times D by DT time derivative of A and B. Uh, and it's given by some matrix multiplying the state factor A and B. If you want to, you can think about multiplying left and right side by H bar, and this will look like the Schrodinger equation to you. Yeah, and formally, it is really exactly the same. Um, this is coupled mode theory now, and we know that this uh, resembles the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so this is the Schrodinger equation of a two-level atom, and this two-level atom is characterized by the frequency splitting between its two levels. This is given in our picture here by the frequency splitting between the two harmonic oscillators. And the two levels of this atom, they are coupled by this coupling term whose strength which is here called small omega c, is given by how much you tilt your potential as you modulate. Okay, so that's the strength of the coupling. And the frequency of the coupling is given by small omega. And we know that we hit resonance, so we can drive the population transitions in this atom efficiently 
whenever our modulation frequency matches the frequency splitting. Yeah? And this is exactly what happens here. So in this, um, in this picture, um, what we observed before here, um, this, this is uh, the dressed modes of a two-level atom introduced by a coherent drive. Okay. Um, and if we want to look at this not in the frequency, but in the time domain, then this is what in a, for an atom we would call Rabi oscillations. Yeah, but for our um, classical system, um, these are whatever classic Rabi oscillations. So it's just population transfer between two harmonic oscillators. The difference is that for a quantum system, whenever you want to figure out in which state the system is, you will do a projective measurement, you destroy it, the system. And in order to collect a measurement like this, you will have to repeat your experiment many, many times. For this classical system, classical harmonic oscillators, you can look at the, at the evolution of these oscillators continuously. So in a single measurement, you can observe this Rabi trace. There's no reason to repeat this experiment because your measurement doesn't collapse the state. Okay? The dynamics, however, is governed by the same equations of motion. Okay, so we can now picture the system on the block sphere. Okay, so this is a that these equations of motion here are the Bloch equations, and uh, I know that I can describe my system in the Bloch space, where let's say the north pole of the Bloch sphere means that my atom is in an excited state. For my classical oscillators, this means that all the population, all the amplitude, is let's say in the y oscillator. Okay. When I'm on the south pole of the Bloch sphere, all the amplitude is in the X oscillator. And if I'm on the equator, equal amplitude is in X and Y. Yeah, but depending on the phase of the two, the oscillator um, oscillates diagonally or it spirals around. Okay, So this would be like the Poincare sphere for polarization. It's also identical. And with this inside of the Bloch sphere, we can play a fun game because of apparently what we what we have is we have coherent control over this two-level system. Now that's the point of being on the Bloch sphere is that you can introduce a rotation vector. And you can bring your system from any starting point on the Bloch sphere to any final point on the Bloch sphere. Okay, so now let's play the game of cooling one mode. Cooling one mode means to move to the north or the south pole because that means that all the energy of the system resides in one mode and the other one is empty or cold, okay? And we can do this by starting on an arbitrary point on the block sphere. Here, I will start on this point on the equator, which is marked in green here and called one. And on this point on the equator, I will now turn on my coupling, okay? And um, the coupling will now give rise to Rabi oscillations, okay? And my coupling will set a phase onto the system. So let's define this as a rotation around this axis E1, okay? So we will spiral around or we circle around on this green dashed um, uh, trajectory. And then what I have to do in order to reach the pole of the block sphere, well, when my um, green dashed line crosses this um, maximum radius uh, circumference of the sphere, at this point, I should switch over to a rotation around the axis E2, yeah, which is perpendicular to E1. And I do this by changing the phase of my drive by 90 degrees, so turning from a sine to a cosine. And this is what is done here at the uh, point two in time. Okay, and now I'm rotating around this um, circle of maximum um, circumference. And this circle runs through the pole of the Bloch sphere. Okay, and now I can observe this rotation for a while. Then I can predict when I will uh, cycle through the pole and I can turn off my modulation. That's what I do then. And this is how I have transitioned from point A to point B on the Bloch sphere deterministically. Um, and in this case, we did it for the example of cooling one mode by pumping all its energy into the other mode. Okay. Good. So this um, 
has been my second example of um, some parametric control that we can exert on our levitated oscillator. And now um, I will wrap up with uh, um, looking at a, an optical levitated parametron. And this is work that I've done uh, together with my colleagues from the physics department here. Um, and uh, the leader of the team is Alexander Eichler, who's going to speak right after me. And he is uh, much more knowledgeable on the topic and he will explain in much more depth um, the uh, intricacies of, of parametrons and parametric oscillators. Okay, so for simple-minded people like me, I'm just uh, this, uh, this, this optical trapper. Um, again, I have a particle and this particle to me, at first order, it's a harmonic oscillator. Okay? And just like we did when we have cooled the harmonic oscillator um, by parametric modulation of the trap, um, we do the same thing here. We modulate the stiffness of the optical trap at um, a frequency which we choose to be close to twice the eigenfrequency of the oscillator. Okay. Now, one quadrature of the oscillator will be cooled. The other quadrature of the oscillator, we don't apply any feedback. We just brute force modulate the stiffness of the oscillator twice its eigenfrequency. Now, the oscillator will be parametrically driven here, like the child on the swing. Okay. And the system can collapse into one of two phase states. Okay. And these phase states we have tried to illustrate here as the blue and the red ball. These are two phase states that are opposite in phase by 180 degrees. And the reason these two phase states exist is because my driving is at twice the eigenfrequency. So in this frame, which is set by the, by the double frequency, there are two states which are exactly the same. And the reason is because the oscillator has to run up the potential, both in the uh, forward cycle, half cycle, and in the backward half cycle. Okay, so to the, towards the parametric modulation, these two phase states look the same. Okay, good. And now you can think, hey, if there are these two phase states that, you, that, that exist there, you could define these as a logic element. Okay, so each of these phase states, um, you can associate with a zero or a one or a plus one or a minus one. Okay, and this is something that has been actually used in electronics. I tried to build uh, somewhere deep in the, um, in the last uh, century. And it's something that the uh, concept that also works in a quantum picture where you can generate a qubit from these two logical elements. Okay, but this shall not disturb us. So here we are really thinking about the, the classical um, um, emotion of this thing. Okay, and now the question arises, hey, if I have this, uh, this system where I can exist with two phase states and I want to associate a logic uh, with these two, the, how can I switch between them? Because switching a logic element is, is one of the essential ingredients you need to do to build any kind of circuit. Okay, so how can I make this oscillator switch its phase by 180 degrees? Well, of course, one option would be to slow it down, okay, and then to ring it back up, but with opposite phase. Okay, but this is slow because this would mean that I'm limited by the uh, by the coherence time or by the damping rate. Uh, I will be limited by the damping rate of this oscillator. Right? And if I use a high Q oscillator, which I want to do, then I will be slow. Okay? So this will be a, a very a non-ideal way of, um, of switching. So how could we do it faster? Well, ideally, um, we could do the following. Um, so look, let's have a look at what's depicted here in the top. Um, on the horizontal axis is time, and on the vertical axis is the position of the oscillator. So it's harmonically swinging, it's just doing its thing with its face. If I could make the oscillator stand still uh, for a half period at its point of maximum excursion, okay, then it would flip phase. Why? Because if, if I look at this phase state, it's, it's here oscillating out, now I make it stand still, the state itself would oscillate back onto the other side in the, in the usual potential, but this is where no potential was present. So the thing stands still. And now if I turn my potential back on, 
I would keep oscillating, but I have acquired a phase shift of pi half. Okay? So had I the possibility or the ability to switch off my potential for exactly half an oscillation period at the right moment, I could switch the phase of this parametron. I could switch it on a time scale, which is just half an oscillation period. It's extremely fast. Okay. Good. And this is what we attempt to do here. Okay. So in principle, we could take this levitated particle. It's oscillating in the optical trap. Now we have this beautiful ability, which clamped optomechanical systems don't have. We can tune very dramatically the oscillation frequency of the oscillator. Okay, the most extreme case would be that I turn off my laser, then the optical trapping potential is absent. Okay, so this is what I could do here. Now, for practical reasons, um, we run the protocol in a, in a slightly less aggressive fashion. What we do is that we switch the stiffness of the trap to half the original value. And instead of having to wait for half an oscillation cycle to pick up a phase difference of pi, we have to wait a full oscillation period okay in the new potential which is a half an oscillation period in the um in the original potential okay and this is what we what we show here so um on the horizontal axis is time and on the vertical axis is the phase of the parametron so phase pi up here means state one and phase uh, zero means state zero Okay. And once a second, we switch by briefly or just a, a half an oscillation period, switching the potential to um, a less stiff um, value. And uh, we can characterize how well this works and look at the fidelity. And this is uh, depicted here as the probability of a successful bit flip. And we um, vary here the deformation time so the time that we switch the potential to the smaller value um, compared to to the original stiffness and you see that indeed um, this uh, protocol has this periodic behavior that you expect so when you switch for half an oscillation period or one oscillation period um, it, this this feature that you fall back into original phase state or that you switch over to the other one this uh, periodically repeats okay now you can ask what limits the fidelity of um, this flipping scheme. Now it is the thermal, the residual thermal population of this oscillator, right? So when you um, look at the phase space distribution, then the, your point is not an infinitely small point in phase space. Okay? So it's not this perfect coherent state, um, but it is, this uh, slightly broadened thermal distribution because you have not initialized the particle perfectly. And this is what uh, gives you this uh, blob of finite size such that it can happen that um, after a rotation, you actually fall um, into the other potential minimum or quasi potential minimum. Okay. Um, now, before I conclude, I just want to point out that um, there is a second variation um, which relies on uh, essentially the same idea. Instead of switching the, the potential, so instead of deforming your potential in order to um, introduce a, a phase flip, you can also shift your potential. And again, the, the argument is that when the oscillator reaches its point of maximum excursion, if you're now able to switch your potential to shift it to the side, such that the, the oscillator is again at a potential minimum, yeah, then it will feel no force. It will not move away from this turnaround point. You can wait for half your oscillation period. Then you can shift the position of the potential back and you can uh, leave the oscillator to ensue oscillating, albeit with a phase that has jumped by, uh, by pi. Okay, good. Um, I hope that this could give a brief and understandable introduction to parametric effects in optically levitated systems. Um, we have discussed uh, three examples. The first one was parametric cooling. The second one was the parametric coupling between different um, oscillators, which are non-degenerate in, in, 
frequency and where the parametric modulation bridges this frequency gap. And we have looked at um, the, an example where we've built a very simple logic element and we have um, realized a flipping of this, um, of the phase state of this uh, parametric oscillator um, with two methods. One was deforming the potential, changing trap stiffness, and the other one was shifting the potential. Okay, um, then thank you very much for your patience and for your interest. If you have any questions, uh, of course, I'm happy to, to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for, for that excellent introduction uh, to parametric uh, optomechanics. Um, we do actually have a question, Martin. Um, so we'll just quickly ask our last this. So it's from YouTube. Um, the question is, can the modulation frequency be time dependent and controlled precisely? Uh, let me make sure that I get the question right. It was, can the modulation frequency be um, time dependent? Can um, the modulation and frequency? Um, do you know if which part of the talk this relates to? Uh, it doesn't say. <laughs> okay, that, in this case, I Maybe will it's assume up to you it, to decide. It, it relates to the first part. So here, when we do the parametric yeah. cooling. Before the pam parametron, sorry. Yeah, if we do the parametric cooling, then it's important that we kind of follow the oscillator in its phase. Okay, so I need to run a phase lock loop or so to track the oscillation frequency. And, it, and this means the phase of the oscillator to always optimize, um, and to, to, to stay, to remain cooling. Otherwise I will start to heat um, the oscillator. In the second part where we do the parametric coupling of the oscillation modes, yes, in principle, you can pick your, um, your, your coupling frequency time dependent. And this can be very clever um, in certain cases where you try to, um, to do coherent control schemes. Typically, if you rapidly switch on and switch off your Rabi pulses, if you like, your pi half or pi pulses, due to this windowing effect, you will introduce higher harmonics. So you can clean up your, your drive pulses by kind of um, more gently uh, modulating on and off your pulses, which would correspond to um, a frequency modulation um, as well. So yes, this is perfectly possible and can be uh, smart under certain, um, uh, situ in certain situations. However, it's not something that we have explored here. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, thank you once again. So I am conscious of time, so we'll move on. If there's any more questions, I'll pass them on at the end of the talk by Alex. Thank, thank, you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Martin, once again. Um, so let me introduce our, our next speaker. Um, so Alexander Ekle studied physics at Basel. Um, he followed with a PhD with Shonen Berg's group. Um, his postdoctoral position was with the Adrian Bachtel in Barcelona, Spain. Um, there, he investigated nanomechanical resonators made from carbon nanotubes and graphene. Um, and then after that, Alexander went to join Christian Degen's group in ETH Zurich, um, working on magnetic resonance force microscopy. So his main interest is, is within this scanning force microscopy and then also uh, the exploration of parametric networks um, in IC machines. And in some senses, the latter that has... Uh, uh, allowed us to invite him, uh, give us an excuse to invite him to this uh, network. And so thank you, Alexander, for accepting our invitation and um, uh, really excited to hear your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mudassar. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay, let's start at the beginning. That's the best way to start. So thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and also the, the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this exciting seminar the uh, series. And um, so I'm going to talk about building icing machines from coupled parametric oscillators, similar, similar to the parametric oscillator that Martin introduced uh, very, very nicely. Thanks uh, a lot, Martin. And I'm not sure if I'm more knowledgeable than you in anything, Martin, in spite of your uh, 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 kind words. So I'm going to talk uh, uh, about this topic, which, which I have to say, there are two parts of, uh, of, of work that we do in our group. 
One is on um, optomechanical spin sensing, where we use optomechanical resonators to detect nuclear spins. And the idea is to do some, some nanoscale variation of magnetic resonance imaging. And we started using uh, silicon nitride membranes for this. Um, we can also parametrically couple two of these highly coherent modes. Uh, I am showing here two of the most recent papers, but I'm not going to talk about this part of, of our work. What I'm going to talk about is our work in parametric networks. And I actually, I don't see the image that should appear down here. Sorry, uh, it's not so important. Um, here, we don't necessarily use optomechanical resonators, but anything that is useful. And uh, I'm mostly going to talk about this upper paper here. Ah, here it is. So um, I have to thank many people for contributing to what I'm going to talk about. Mostly, I have to say I am thankful to Ode Silberberg and uh, Architra, my theory collaborators at, at ETH, and Ode is now in Constance. They sort of dragged me into this adventure in the first place, and it, it has been a really a fun ride so far, and I'm looking forward to more collaborations with them in the future. So I'm going to talk about some sort of logic machine, and therefore it's fitting that we start discussing what logic we use nowadays um, for, for our computers. So all our computers, our smartphones, the laptops and so on are for Neumann type machines. That means they have a memory unit down here where information is stored. They have a logic unit where information is computed. And every time something happens in our computer then information is carried from the memory unit through a single bus to the logic unit, something happens with it, and the result is stored again in the memory unit. This just happened to be the most feasible way of building computers back in the days. But of course, it's not the only way how you can build computers. It was known back then already that you could also think about something like an artificial neural network. So our brain, for instance, is, is very broadly speaking, as a, for, for a physicist like me, is built up of neurons, and each neuron is at the same time a memory unit and a logic unit. So think of a neuron as some function f here that has inputs x1, x2, x3, which are the states of other neurons. And they are sent to our neuron through the network connections with different weights, w's. Um, and then our neuron performs some sort of threshold function with these, uh, with these uh, inputs. For instance, it fires when the sum of the thresholds are beyond a certain value or something like that. And then the state of our neuron is sent to other neurons. So it becomes the input for other neurons. And this forms a network and the network can continuously update depending on the information that is included into the network from outside. And for certain tasks, it's much more efficient to use a neural network than for Neumann type architecture. So we know that we are using in our computers nowadays some sort of simulated neural networks, but they use many, many transistors for a single neuron. And it would probably be very advantageous to build physical machines that implement single neurons as a single physical nanoscale device, right? So if we want to do something like that, as physicists, we think of each neuron typically as a two-level system. So now here we have a drawing of coupled two-level systems. They have here just some nearest neighbor coupling, but in reality, it could be more than nearest neighbor. Also, often you think about some coupling to the outside world, that's fluctuation, dissipation. And the simplest way how we can describe such a network is the Ising Hamiltonian, right? So if we think of, about, of, of every two level system as a spin that has a state plus one or minus one, these are the sigmas here. So each spin has a state sigma and the couplings are the J's then the Ising Hamiltonian tells us which configuration of the Ising network is the ground state or how, how, how optimal every possible state is. If you talk about uh, this network to engineers, by the way, just use the word Hopfield network, then they will also understand. So this is a very generous, uh, a general uh, picture because the finding the ground state of the icing Hamiltonian is equivalent or almost equivalent can be mapped to many other optimization problems like the traveling salesman problem, MuxCAT, uh, number partitioning and so on. So if you 
can find the ground state of an icing Hamiltonian, you can also solve these other optimization problems. And all of these optimization problems belong to a class of computational problems that are very hard to solve with our conventional computers. So finding the ground state of an icing Hamiltonian deterministically with current computers is something that becomes impossible even for relatively small numbers of spins. So the idea is to build a physical network that corresponds to an icing network, let it run in some way, find the ground state, and that's the answer to your optimization problem. Okay. And if we want to do that, then there are many different types of implementations that we could consider. Uh, of course, the most elegant and most ambitious way is to use actual spins, but we could also replace the spins with other type of two-level systems, like for instance, maybe a qubit or bistable resonators. And at that point, you may have guessed that I'm going to talk about using parametric oscillator phase states as bistable resonator states for networks. So Martin already introduced a lot of that topic, so I can go relatively quickly over this. Just for reference, I'm using this equation of motion, which you've seen before in his talk. The white part is the harmonic oscillator with some fluctuating drive. We modulate the spring constant or the, the potential energy with a depth lambda. I think Martin called it eta, I call it lambda, it's the same thing at a frequency two omega and omega is typically close to the resonance frequency. So like Martin said, we are going to modulate our potential close to twice the resonance frequency. And then we also need in our equation a nonlinearity that avoids sort of explosion. It, this limits our amplitude. And then if we start from a thermal state or a ground state, something that has this typical round Gaussian shape and we apply a parametric drive with a certain phase, then What's gonna happen is that, like Martin said, you can either cool or amplify your motion. And here you see in this axis, I'm cooling my motion. And in this axis, I'm amplifying my motion. And you can think about that as equivalent to increased or decreased damping. So here I'm increasing my effective damping in that direction that makes cooling. And here I'm decreasing my damping and then this becomes a squeezed state, classical squeezed state. Or if it starts from a quantum ground state, you get a quantum squeezing. And the decreased damping can become negative or, or zero. And what happens then, if you have zero damping, then your state wants to explode. The harmonic oscillator becomes unstable and it will ring up to large amplitude and will settle into a large amplitude state that is limited by the nonlinearity. Uh, so depending on where you started here, depending on your history, you will either ring up to this phase state or to this phase state. And like Martin explained, they're both stable states under the same parametric drive. So this is a bistable system, okay? And for the rest of the talk, we are going to pretend that these two states play the role of a single spin in zero field. So they're degenerate spin states and we want to use them for computation. And we also need to know that how much you have to drive to excite this uh, parametric phase states depends on your detuning. So in, this is a numerical example with a resonance frequency of 100. Uh, if you're driving exactly at twice your resonance frequency, you cross the threshold here. If you're detuned, you have to drive harder. So this solid line here is the threshold of lambda that you have to uh, exceed to obtain parametric drive. Or, or the instability. So U is for unstable. That means the harmonic oscillator is unstable and you get your phase states and S is for stable. So the zero state remains stable in this region. Now there's one more thing. Look at this dotted line here. If you follow this dotted line, this is the graph on the right side. So here we have first, we are at the position where you, the zero state is stable. Then we cross the threshold to the Arnold tongue. This is what we call the Arnold tongue, this shape. And inside the Arnold tongue, we only have the two large amplitude phase states. And the amplitude of these states increases as a function of detuning because of the nonlinearity. It's very sim similar to a Duffing or Kerr resonator. Um, it's just here, it's the same origins to nonlinearity that makes this, this weird shape. And then we exit the Arnold tongue again, but the large amplitude state uh, remains stable for some time. 
and it coexists with a zero uh, amplitude state. So this hysteresis here, we have to be aware. And if we have a negative nonlinearity, then everything is mirrored with respect to the resonance frequency. And then you would have the shape going up here on this side. And actually we are going to see an experiment afterwards where the nonlinearity was negative. So I think now everything is set and we're ready to go on. So now that we understood what a single parametric oscillator is, I used the, the, the short KPO for curved parametric oscillator because many people use that term nowadays. Now we want to think about what we can do with a network of these. So if one KPO is like a single spin, then a network of KPOs should in some sense behave like a network of spins. That's the logic. And the idea is now that we have this network, we drive it with a parametric drive, all of them at the same time, they all ring up to some state, they go to a collective oscillation state, and then we read out this oscillation state and assume that the state that the system obtained is the ground state of the Hamiltonian, the Ising Hamiltonian. So by checking that, you know, we have a spin down, spin down, spin down, spin down, spin up, spin up, spin down, spin down, spin up, that will be the ground state. That's just a hypothesis, right? We cannot be sure that this is true at the moment. And if we want to encode different problems, like different Ising Hamiltonians, or different max cut problems, then we have to be able to program the coupling strings. So these, these are the levers or the knobs that we want to program to encode different problems. So just assume we are able to do that. Um, what should we do then? We want to encode our problem. Then we want to find a protocol of which we sort of know that it will produce the ground state. That's our main desire, right? And this is not easy to check. I think I will show you afterwards that even for two coupled oscillators, this is something that you have to think about and verify. And the problem is of course also that if you go to large networks, you cannot even check that the solution is the right one because you, that's exactly the problem, right? You cannot compute the ground state deterministically with your computer. So you sort of have to trust your network Oracle to produce the right result. So what we should do, in my opinion, is to study these networks with very small networks, understand them analytically until we are confident enough to predict the behavior of large networks. And this is something that uh, it's a beautiful task, but it will keep us busy for some time, I predict. So we are talking about coupled oscillators. And also like Martin, I'm now going to talk about normal modes. It's something that you learned early on in your physics uh, education that uh, two pendula that are coupled, they make normal modes that are stable. So there's either the symmetric normal mode or the anti-symmetric um, normal mode. Now this is for a harmonic oscillator. And the question is whether this still works for nonlinear parametric oscillators. And it turns out, so if you assume that your nonlinearity is weak and your coupling is weak, then this still works. Uh, you can throw away many terms that would make uh, some, some funny effect and you can say, okay, uh, if I squint a little, then I can predict that what I will get is still normal modes of parametric oscillators. So you will have an anti-symmetric parametric oscillator and a symmetric parametric oscillator. They both behave like a single parametric oscillator with sort of a larger mass or something like that, right? And in this case here, the anti-symmetric mode has a lower frequency because the coupling is negative. Then the frequency of the anti-symmetric mode is going to be the lower one. And there's many uh, excellent proposals for building icing machines out there. I just listed three that I uh, sort of refer to often. Um, and they, they sort of start at this point and say, now what do you have to do to get the right Oracle um, solution? And the, the typical protocol is that you start in the zero state, you increase your drive until you cross a threshold. And at the threshold, your system will undergo bifurcation and will now enter the anti-symmetric Arnold tongue. And in this case, the parametric oscillators will go to opposite phase states. So the spins will have opposite signs. And then afterwards, you also cross the symmetric Arnold tongue, but it doesn't matter anymore because you're now in a stable large amplitude state and it, it will not change anymore until you shake it very much. So if you go far above threshold and you read out your system, you will get the anti-symmetric solution, which is the correct solution for negative coupling. So in this case, it's sort of trivial to check that um, the Oracle gives the right answer. And we can also check that 
experimentally. This is uh, unpublished data from, from my student Gabriel, where he has uh, two very weakly coupled uh, micromechanical resonators. And the, the coupling is so weak that you don't even see the, the, the overlap uh, fringes. But when he increases the drive for negative detuning, he gets anti-symmetric state and for positive uh, detuning, he gets a symmetric state. So this simple thing sort of works nicely. But we were talking about weak coupling here, and that means slow energy exchange between the resonators. And for many experimental situations, you will want to be in a fast energy exchange uh, situation because you, you will want your energy exchange to be faster than the ring down time, such that you can do, for instance, quantum adi adiabatic uh, transitions between different uh, phases. And that automatically means that you need strong coupling. So your coupling rate must be faster than your decay rate. And that was something where we were not sure whether the nonlinear uh, strongly coupled oscillators would still sort of obey that normal mode picture. And that's what we wanted to check, right? So that was the prediction what we should get. And we wanted to make sure that this is actually true. And we decided to test this in the simplest experimental system we could think of, which is two coupled RLC circuits. Each of these things here is one resonator. It has a, a, an inductance. It has a nonlinear capacitance, which is just, just a, a Varactor diode. And then it also has an effective resistance, which is not uh, implemented. You know, there, We didn't put any resistor in, but it's just that the cables have a resistance. And then uh, they are coupled capacitively. So, okay, now let me show you the results. This is a very busy slide, but I'm gonna talk you uh, through this slowly and bit by bit. On the upper left, you see the experimental result. You can see white is where there was no oscillation. Blue is where we had the symmetric oscillation state and red is where we had the anti-symmetric oscillation state. And we always, always sweep from left to right in this example. And you can see that the overall shape is exactly the two shifted Arnold tongues that we expected. Uh, and the red and blue lines around them, these are the theory lines with the parameters that we extracted from other calibration measurements. So this works perfectly well. We are happy that we can, to first order, build strongly coupled KPO networks and that our intuition still sort of holds. But then if we start looking at details, there's a couple of things that we didn't understand at first. And one of them is if you look at this dashed line where uh, lambda is now given in units of volt, so it's at around 2.5 volt. Here we sweep from a zero state, so both resonators are at zero amplitude. Then we cross this threshold to the anti-symmetric Arnold tongue, and the two resonators both immediately ring up with opposite sign, but not with exactly the same amplitude. So this is not a nice anti-symmetric state. It becomes a nice anti-symmetric state in this region here. So what happens here is that the nonlinearity effectively couples the two um, parametric oscillators and the normal mode basis is not a good basis anymore to describe the behavior. So we have a mixed state, M is for mixed. And here you would say maybe that this, is, this can still be attributed to a, you know, an anti-symmetric, uh, anti-ferromagnetic state. But we have to be careful that when we go to larger networks, maybe this will not be recognizable as anything that can correspond to an icing state anymore, okay? But then we go on, we are in between the two Arnold tongues. We go down to a zero state. And then we ring up into the symmetric state. And this is a very nice symmetric state. Two resonators are on top of each other, have same amplitude and the same sign until we ex exit the Arnold tongue again here and we are back to zero. Now, if we repeat this at a higher amplitude, we get a very different behavior. We start again from zero, then we jump into a nice anti-symmetric state at this point. And then at this point here, we jump into the symmetric state. And now this was very puzzling to us. We assumed that as long as we are in the anti-symmetric Arnold tongue, this state would remain stable and we would jump to the symmetric state at this point here. But it turns out that it jumps up to the symmetric state already 
prematurely, almost here in the middle of the Arnold Tongue. And this happens for this entire stretch here. So there, there's an entire part of the antisymmetric Arnold Tongue that is chewed out that sort of doesn't exist and where the system already has to jump to the symmetric state. What is happening here? If you look at the theory solution down there, you see that they reproduce this perfectly, again, with uh, parameters that were, were calibrated uh, from other measurements. So we were very happy with the, with the uh, sort of agreement to our experiments. And now explaining this feature here is something that I don't find easy in an intuitive way, but I will try. Look at these bifurcation points, the red and the blue one here. These are these two lines. So at, at these lines, the system undergoes a bifurcation and the number of stable and unstable solutions changes. So for instance, if you go here along this dashed line, this is an unstable solution as a function of frequency. At this point, it becomes two unstable solutions, which you don't see in experiment, and a stable solution at zero. And then this stable solution at zero becomes two stable solutions with the anti-symmetric solution and one unstable one. So that's sort of what we are used to. That's sort of what we see here. Now here, something funny happened because we increased our parametric drive and these two uh, bifurcation points inverted their order. So between them, there can be no more uh, stable zero state. And what the system decides to do then for lack of alternatives is to create between these two bifurcation points a doubly unstable state. So it's still an unstable state. We go from an unstable state to two unstable states and one doubly unstable state. The math of the system demands that this happens. And this doubly unstable state then becomes two doubly unstable states and one singly unstable state. And this means that the antisymmetric solution, the stable antisymmetric solution, cannot start to exist at this bifurcation point here. Instead, it only starts existing here where the interaction between the nonlinearity and the, and the strong coupling sort of gives rise to another bifurcation point that is not present in, in, in a weakly coupled system. And it jumps into a stable antisymmetric solution. So the inversion of the um, bifurcation points means that the antisymmetric solution is wiped out is in, in this entire area. And this is something very important now. If you want to use this as an oracle for your um, icing Hamiltonian, you need to be aware that this region is, is a no-go zone, right? If, if your trajectory sort of brings you in, into such a zone, and there's no guarantee that this zone couldn't be larger or even appear more to the left, then you would obtain the symmetric solution as the result of your computation, even though the anti-symmetric solution is the correct solution. So these are things that we need to understand in detail um, and, and be aware of when we run a network as a machine. And for two parametric oscillators, I would say we understand it now pretty well, um, but we need to build up more intuition for you know, going from n to n plus one. So the next will be to devote some time just to three parametric oscillators. There's one more funny feature that I want to say before uh, concluding, and that is when you go to larger networks, n larger than two, then there is a uh, inconsistency in the number of solutions. Namely, an icing Hamiltonian has two to the n solutions. You have n spins, each spin can be up or down, so you get two to the n configurations that are possible. Our network has n normal modes, and each normal mode has two phase states, so we get two times n solutions. That means our network cannot faithfully uh, mm, show all solutions that correspond to the icing Hamiltonian. So it may be that the right solution is always present, but this is something that at the moment I would say we cannot guarantee. And just as an example, we don't have experiments yet, but we have numerical solutions, numerical simulations. I would just want to show you this here. This is a simulated sweep of a three resonator network. And you can see this Arnold tongue here. Two resonators are symmetric to each other and at large amplitude. The third resonator is at zero. So clearly this is something that doesn't correspond to any icing state because a fermionic spin is always up or down and never zero. So these are also things that we have to be careful. What could be the solution of reconciling the normal mode picture with the icing picture? Well, often what is uh, used as an argument is that if you go to very large driving, 
the coupling becomes effectively weak compared to the driving strength and then the influence of these uh, normal mode uh, picture becomes weaker and you go towards something that should be like an icing uh, picture. And what I think at the moment, what my hypothesis is, is that there will be further bifurcations that give rise to a more mixed state and these mixed state can then maybe restore the right kind of solution space. But of course, the solution space could also be larger than the icing solution space because we know that the parametric oscillator with its hysteresis can have up to three stable solutions, not only two. So it could be that in the end, we end up with something that has three to the end solutions and we need to pick the right type of solutions uh, to solve our Hamiltonian problem. So this is something very intriguing for me. Um, it could be very difficult to solve, but I think it, it's a very rich area um, to, to research. And this brings me to my conclusions. My main message is that strong coupling is important for many applications of KPO networks. And we sort of still, uh, we understand how to do strong coupled networks. It's feasible, it's doable. We can still use most of our intuition that, and that's very good. But we need to carefully calibrate them because the nonlinear uh, coupling can give rise to some funny effects that we wouldn't expect when we stand in front of a whiteboard and, and sort of predict what's gonna happen. And theory, uh, at least for small numbers of resonators is very good at predicting this. And in the future, um, what I personally want to study next is going to slightly larger networks and see how these additional bifurcations appear. So I think this is something that will be very interesting to study. Another direction of course is making networks with quantum coherent oscillators. And at the moment, uh, the best example is Josephson parametric oscillators, but it could also be optomechanical resonators that you can use as quantum coherent devices. There is the hope that bringing quantum coherent resonators into a, a superposition will help to find the ground state of the icing Hamiltonian more efficiently. And that would of course be very important and interesting. And then finally, when we go to larger networks, we need to solve the question of how to connect all to all and how to program this. And this will be a technical feat. There's various um, proposals how to do that with different advantages and disadvantages. And I think that will also be a very exciting uh, thing to study. So with this, thank you all for listening. Um, thanks again for the invitation, Mudasar and, and team. And um, I'm looking forward to a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, for, for that really interesting series of results and, um, uh, and um, ideas for all of us to sort of think about um, in our respective fields. Um, if there are any questions, Clara, from YouTube, please let me know. Um, anyone here, of course, is, feel free to raise your hand and I'll, I'll unmute yourself. Um, but while everyone is mulling over what what their question is going to be. <laughs> um, I, I just had a clarification. I, I might have missed this slide, so please, I apologize for asking you to repeat yourself. Um, it's just, so when you introduced this really nice picture of going from this neural networks idea, um, what I didn't understand is the link between the individual nodes having a memory and a logic operation um, to, um, I guess, this uh, single uh, icing model as such. Um, could you just clarify that link again? Sure. Um, let me just, I think, no, not like this. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. So maybe, uh, I don't know, this would be a good slide for that, maybe. Um, so in a neural network, you don't have a memory where information is stored and then you take it to your CPU, but rather the state of the neural network at any time is the output. So, I mean, our brain continuously updates and, and the state changes all the time, but here we would sort of program the neural network or the artificial neural network with a certain set of coupling constants, these, uh, these J's, and then we would let it run until it finds a steady state. So at some point it shouldn't change anymore. And then we look at the state and that would be our answer. So we would note down the state of every spin in that network. 
and that would then be our answer vector. Does this answer the question? Yeah, I think I see that. Um, and so then the, the, and how would you, um, so then the driving essentially allows you to, you can do external driving essentially on this to introduce um, or modulate the, the Hamiltonian that you want. That right? right, so the driving in a sense, we, we are working, well, you could think of this entire network in the rotating frame. It looks a little bit like a multi-stable system, right? You have an n-dimensional space where you have minima, deeper and shallower minima, and you want to find the best minimum for your system. And the drive is only the thing that gives rise to this multi-stable beast. The parametric drive is always the same. It's not, it's not something that we do different every time. We want to do this the same every time. This is just the external uh, boundary condition that we are changing slowly or fast. But the thing that will give rise to different solution every time should be the different coupling constants. Okay. No, thank you, that, that makes sense, thanks. Um, there's a question from Clara, if you want to unmute Clara. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this very clear talk. I was just wondering about um, this difference in the number of states that you can represent. So the number of ground states in the icing model and the number of states you can represent here. So do you have an intuition for which states you might miss? Um, that you can't represent, so because the um, two n is uh, much smaller than. I think it's not going to be something systematic. It's going to depend on your coupling constants. So here, for instance, if you, I mean, this was this example that I'm showing here on the left side. This was engineered to show uh, an example where it doesn't work, right? If you change in this numerical simulation the coupling constant between one and two or something like that a little bit then resonator three will also start um, oscillating again. So it's, it, it will really depend on your encoded coupling where the system shows what. And, and I don't think it's something at the moment that I, I don't have an intuition of, of making some general predictions, no. Yeah, thanks, that, that's very interesting. Another idea, another question, if I may uh, quickly um, add to this, um, what about superpositions. Um, I imagine this is something that you probably can't represent because it's all classical, but or are there ideas how you would be able to yeah, even, even look at this? Right. So um, at the moment, the only system where you can have parametric oscillators and you operate them in, in a quantum coherent fashion in the low particle number regime are these Josephson superconducting resonators like uh, Alex Grimm, from the Devroy group, uh, Martin also flashed this paper, it's the same paper. Um, they managed to do that two years ago. And this is really something that, that is very new that, we, that, that people can operate a parametric oscillator in the small number regime and make superpositions and controlling these cat states and making gates. Mm -hmm. It's difficult because you need a very, very strong nonlinearity. If your nonlinearity is weak, your parametric states will uh, have a very large occupation number. You're not going to be in the low uh, occupation number regime, and then your decoherence time will be very short. In his case, it was a relatively long. And there, actually, they, they say that this can be advantageous because they can um, store information um, in coherent states, which are, which are less vulnerable to, to single particle loss. And then, in general, there, there are these predictions that if you manage to have your network in a quantum coherent superposition state, and then you quantum coherently uh, change your boundary conditions or your parametric drive across the boundary, you should remain uh, in, in the ground state of the corresponding Hamiltonian according to the uh, quantum adiabatic, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, theorem. And this should sort of guarantee that you find the ground state. But I think experimentally, this will be very important to verify and study. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Clara. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I am aware we're slightly out of time, um, over time. I'm grateful for everyone for staying put and, uh, and, and uh, being with us. Um, but Thank you very much. if there aren't any more questions, um, then let me thank both of our speakers, Alexander and Martin, once again.
for joining us today and giving us an introduction and also an, 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 a, a sort of a frontiers image of where parametron, par, parametrons are heading, um, both in levitated optomechanics, but in, 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 uh, in other systems as well. Uh, and thank you everyone else for joining us uh, throughout the year. Um, so this is, as I said, the last uh, of our talks and um, please keep uh, an eye out for the next future seminars and they'll start up in September, October time, hopefully. Uh, so once again, thank you. And thank you, Alexander and Martin for joining us. Have thank, a great you for the, thank you for the invitation. All the best, goodbye. Bye. It was great, bye-bye. <laughs>